All right, good morning, everybody. I'm here with Doug Casey and a friend of ours, John Robb. If you're not familiar with John's work, uh, you will really get a kick out of today's episode because John is one of the most unique thinkers out there today. He has a special operations background. He uh, worked and uh, planned uh, counterterrorism missions. Um, he was an entrepreneur in technology, an analyst in technology, and but he's most famous for his thinking about warfare. And um, you'll hear a little bit about that today, but he has, a, he has a Patreon account. I definitely encourage everybody to go and subscribe to it. It's completely worth it. He's thinking about things literally years ahead of anyone else. Sometimes when you read it, it'll seem crazy. And then you'll go back three years later and be like, this is exactly what he predicted. So with that, John, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate you being here. So I have a whole bunch of things I want to talk to you about, but I wonder if you could give first people a, basically a framework for the way you think about the world. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. That's a big framework. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm writing mostly today about the intersection of technology, warfare, and politics. And my focus has been on how uh, social networking is rewiring us, rewiring our brains in a McLuhan sense. Uh, we're, we're thinking differently. We're moving from, you know, reading uh, in isolation and forming an opinion, uh, like driven by the printing press, to pattern matching. And pattern matching affects the way we think as individuals, as well as how we interact with the world. Uh, we have a fast flow of information going by, and we just pick out the little bits that uh, make sense to us. We fit it into the patterns, and then we join with others to curate big patterns. Um, that curation has created uh, network tribes uh, that have a level of cohesion you see in a, a standard tribal framework. On the left, uh, we've seen most of the action in, in forming those tribes. Um, we see uh, uh, the anti-racist, the anti-fascist. Uh, they uh, aren't forming tribes based on patterns or narratives that are positive. They have formed tribes based on the idea that uh, there's a pattern of behavior of people they hate and uh, they can all agree on that. They can't agree on what justice is or anything positive or any kind of single narrative because all of their uh, value frameworks are subjectively, subjectively derived. So what they can't agree on is who they hate. And um, they build these tribes through what I call empathy triggers. Uh, empathy, as I dug into the neuroscience of it, is really kind of a, a pre-verbal communication system. It allows you to transfer a mental model through stories or through actions that directly to another person and they mimic it. They model it themselves based on those cues. They fill in the blanks. I and mean, when somebody gets hit and they, they, they are injured, you feel that injury, you grimace. Or when you have a, a video of George Floyd with a, a knee on his neck, you feel that knee on your neck. You get mad, you get angry. Um, and um, that works really, really well in social networking. Um, and it's used to create that kind of selective empathy that you have in uh, warfare and in tribal warfare, where you get 100% of the empathy for the people inside the tribe and zero for the people outside. And negative, actually, because it doesn't really matter what happens to them. They're enemies. Anything they say or do is you know, an attack. Um, and anything that happens to them is well-deserved. So... Um, Another framework I have is oh yeah go ahead. No, that's a good place. To, that's 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 a good place to start. I want to talk about networking in general and how everything is through a network now, also. But I, you know, one of the things that I think you hear people on the right often say is they're trying to constantly compare. You know, well, you know, this standard applies to them, and they're they're trying to get people in this hypocrisy trap. But like as I noticed a couple of years ago, and I think off of something you said in one of your in one of your newsletters that that didn't work anymore. Like, because there's such, they're distinct tribes that, that it's all totally fruitless. You're only talking to your own tribe, essentially, when you're even pointing it out. Right, right. Um, yeah, it's an asymmetric contra conflict. You can't, the, the same rules don't apply. Um, there's no common ground. Uh, and that, um, you know, any harm that you, you experience is not going to be experienced by the people on the other side. Remember um, uh, Apocalypse Now, where, you know, Colonel Kurtz kind of going, Oh, I, you know, if I only had these soldiers that would operate like these tribesmen, you know, they would go out and do horrific things all day and they come home to their families and kiss their kids on the head and they go to sleep like sleep like babies. Um, but he couldn't get that because people had that uh, 
common ground between people that uh, we have in modern society, we had in modern society, and it doesn't exist as in the tribal framework. The people outside the tribe aren't human. Hmm. Um, you know, like most of the, you know, when you hear, uh, what does this tribe call itself? It usually calls itself the people or the humans, <laughs> you know, it, it's <laughs> like everyone outside of that is not, um, it's, uh, so anything you do to them, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it, it won't have a, a negative impact on your uh, emotional frameworks. So, um, we're getting that, we're getting that kind of selective empathy, uh, that we would only see in wartime. In peacetime, somehow we created it. We're allowing it to continue. Yeah. How do you define the difference between the rightists and the leftists? Why do people fall into one general category or the other? Have you thought about that? Yeah, I've been thinking about that. And um, one of the things I find about, you know, I see network decision making as a new decision making, social decision making system. We had, you know, markets. We had traditional tribalism, which kind of gave us nationalism, um, which kind of gave us that, that, that uh, collective identity that allowed us to trust the information that other people were giving, at least to, that it was not meant to hurt us. And then we had um, bureaucracy, which is really the cockroach of organizations, but it, it fueled governments, it fueled the science infrastructure, it fueled everything, it fueled corporations. Um, now we have this new decision-making system that we haven't figured out how to deal with yet, how to actually fully bind. Um, and, uh, you know, that social decision-making system is, uh, good at a lot of things, it's great at mobilization, but, um, one of the ways I think it makes decisions is it's very good at consensus building, you know, everybody thinking the same thing, um, and getting that information and, and mobilizing very quickly. Um, and it's also good at, uh, spreading dissent and, uh, you know, trying to pick away at arguments, uh, and that you know, a functional social decision-making system balances dissent and consensus building. Um, a dysfunctional one wipes out all the dissent and the consensus gets big and it st gets stuck there and it just lasts forever. The, the right is basically on this pole, uh, the dissent function, and the left is becoming the consensus function. Um, the left is like, either you're with us or you're against us. Uh, we're going to shame you if you fall outside this framework. And the right is trying to find, they're like kind of a collection of, of dissenters on everything. Um, and they uh, are picking apart the arguments and trying to show that it, that, that consensus is wrong or it's outlived its usefulness or, uh, uh, you know, it needs to be reversed. So it's like a different kind of uh, political spectrum, consensus dissent, at least within the, the network world. Does that make sense? Or yeah, I can get, why would somebody <clears throat> fall into the uh, left as the right? Is it a psychological thing or is it because they were indoctrinated earlier in life? Or uh, what, what makes the difference between a, a rightist and a leftist joining one crew as opposed to the other? Yeah, I haven't really figured out the, what the driver is, what the a key indicator is. Um, people on the left in the consensus group tend to be comforted by, you know, having people around them saying the same thing um, and, uh, you know, comfort in numbers. Uh, they tend to get, you know, very hysterical if people don't agree with them um, and that there is, you know, the existence of this dissent out there. Um, it's a, uh, it's, Largely, you know, the way you see the world, I guess. Uh, I don't have a very unique answer for this yet. Uh, dissent is still people who are seeing flaws in the system. They see uh, a need to, you know, pick at the, the, the consensus. They, you know, we saw this in COVID where we had a consensus for a very short period of time. And then because it wasn't acted upon or wasn't wasn't put in place, then the, the, the dissent started picking away at it. Um, yeah, I don't have a I don't have a neat answer for that yet, but that was a good question. So if I don't have a neat answer, that means it's a great question. Yeah. John, one of the things that you mentioned um, in a recent newsletter was that there was this emerging pattern on the right that was could lead to uh, you know a real a real lasting tribalism on the right that maybe didn't exist on the left so far, and this is this pattern of conspiracy where 
you know, it almost is like the, the same um, uh, consensus building pattern that you might have with like anti-racism or, you know, th those, right. those on the left, but this, this emerging pattern on the right of, of conspiracy. Can you talk about what that looks like to you? Yeah. Um, you know, the whole Trump phenomena was largely, from my perspective, uh, dissent. And it, uh, uh, Trump was put into place to stir things up. And from his method of operation, he was uh, he, he was perfect for that. I mean, he moved fast transients from one topic to the next, to disruption, constantly disrupting. And as long as he was continuing to disrupt the system from locking down from that consensus, from locking everything down, he was supported. Um, but his support base was all over the map. Uh, it, you know, it didn't have a, you know, a, a common thread that tied it all together other than they didn't like the existing system. Uh, and as long as he was disrupting, he, you know, fulfilled what I call the plausible promise of, of, of the kind of open source movement behind him. Uh, the problem was, is that, uh, you know, it's tough to keep an open source movement if, you know, it is you know, removed from power or achieves its objective. And, you know, with Trump expecting deep platforming, uh, what happened was, is that the, uh, they moved into conspiracy frameworks in order to kind of provide that kind of pattern cohesion, a pattern like the left of, of, of things they hate or, or this opposition, this existential evil. Um, and the problem with that was a fork in the insurgency. It just was a hard fork. Uh, kind of very similar to what happened with uh, uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq in, in 2007 when they attacked the Golden Mosque. It, you know, they were fighting the Americans, and then Al Qaeda decided that, oh yeah, we're going to you know expand this into a religious war with the Shia, and they attacked the Golden Mosque, and all of a sudden there was these massive militias moving through Baghdad doing ethnic cleansing, and the every time the uh, uh, Sunni insurgency tried to form something large enough to fight them, they were pounded by the Americans from above, right? And so they were caught in this like uh, pincher, which caused them to uh, negotiate. Uh, so forks are potentially dangerous that, you know, I had written about the uh, idea that if once you have a hard fork like that, it goes towards confrontation. And, and most of those folks on the Capitol event were all conspiracists. You watch the videos of them inside the Capitol. They were uh, you know, almost LARPing. You know, it's like a live action role playing where they were looking for evidence on the desks of the of the different congressmen for you know, proof that the election was rigged um, and what, you know, uh, Cruz was going to actually do. <laughs> it was just wild just watching him go through every everybody's uh, documents. Um, but that event was seen as an attack and uh, seen as violence, extreme violence, even though it was unarmed and, you know, it was deadly granted, but it was, it was an unarmed riot. Um, and that, as I anticipated, would cause an extreme overreaction that the, that the establishment would then launch uh, counterterrorism. They would launch uh, Patriot Act 2.0. Uh, they would start to hunt down people attached to the event and then expand that into a uh, hunt for uh, every group that potentially is a dissent to the establishment. And that um, eventually we get into this counterinsurgency uh, where you have these fundamentalists, which are these enemies who are all the people who have a reason to dissent from the, the uh, establishment view, um, seen as enemies and people that need to be deprogrammed. Um, and it creates this insurgency where there wasn't one. So these you know, small groups are all mostly scattered and mostly uh, nonviolent. And you start putting pressure on them. You start to do no-knock raids and you start to disappear. I mean, you start to go after their families and surveil them. And you start to create this real thing. And uh, well, John, it rolled out uh, that way. It's looks like, looking exactly like that pattern. Yeah, it kind of seems that way to me, too. Yep. Do we know... Uh, for a fact that there was a lot of infiltration uh, by Antifa and BLM uh, in this, you know, very mild riot. I, it's not even the right word to call it, I think. It was just a bunch of Republicans that were unhappy, uh, more than a riot. But was there a lot of infiltration, do you think? Uh, a little bit. I mean, there was infiltration last year in the BLM riots uh, by uh, 
guys on the right, different right groups and different individuals. So, I mean, everybody who wanted to accelerate things, uh, everyone who wants this, you know, to, to become a, a violent conflict in the United States or shows up, it's just a matter of course, but there were so many different little groups and individual actors. It's, it's really hard to determine, you know, differentiate. I don't see, I don't think it was predominantly Antifa or uh, BLM infiltrators, you know, there's onesies and twosies. It was a, it was a mess. I was watching it in live streams. I had three different live streams going and I was watching from different angles in the Capitol and, you know, it was just chaotic. It, there was no rhyme or reason. There was no plan. Um, it just happened. It just seems like there's a spirit abroad in the land where a lot of people want to imminentize the eschaton. They want to get it on. In other words, they've defined the enemy. Right. And they're, and they're looking for a fight. I mean, on both sides at this point. So that's the only comment. I'm, do you see it that way too? Or is that? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. There's lots of people who want it. Um, unfortunately, right now for the right, the dissent function is that um, it's caught with three enemies. It's got the establishment, the traditional neoliberal establishment, you know, represented in the, in the government and, and a lot of corporations. And, and um, they're pretty hollow. I mean, you know, they can't really do anything domestically in terms of programs or anything like that, or even any kind of reforms. What they can do is like push the button on counterterrorism and, and warfare. Um, they are going back, trying to roll back the clock to this kind of hyper normal. Everything is placid. Everything is great kind of world of Obama and, and Bush and, and Clinton. Um, and then you have the uh, big corporations, the network corporations who proved, you know, decisively that they can control the flank, the online flank of, of the uh, establishment. I mean, they took out, when they banned Trump as a sit, seated president, uh, they proved that they could take out the most powerful person in the world without repercussion. I mean, ban them from social networking, which is you know, a huge part of the media consumption that uh, 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 people consume worldwide. Um, Facebook, for instance, has three and a half billion users, and that's where people get the majority of their news overseas. Um, and uh, then you have the uh, the tribal left, and the tribal left is uh, you know, going out there and doing this uh, you know, open source shaming system where they're finding all the pictures of all the people uh, who ever say anything against uh, or who churned up the riot in particular. Uh, they have, you know, just identified all, you know, 6,000 unique images. They're taking out the police images and then they are going to permanentize the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the loss of jobs, the loss of status. Uh, I fully expect it to probably get folded into the blockchain or a blockchain at some point. Uh, so uh, it can, you know, keep that shaming function going forever. Um, so they are all together. Um, and the dissent, the, the right is all by itself. It's really, uh, it's really outgunned at this point. I don't uh, see a happy future where there's a balance between the two. Where does Antifa fit into this? Because they saw, you know, yesterday during the inauguration, they were, they had different protests at different state capitals, for instance. And right. uh, it seems like, you know, they were in alignment at one point with the left, but it seems like, you know, they might, they might, be this other force that's kind of breaking away. What do you think about that? Yeah, um, they're they're doing something that's going to get them put into the uh, dissent fund, you know, dissent group, and they'll end up getting swept up with the uh, uh, counterterrorism, counterinsurgency effort that's that's building. In fact, they were already. I uh, I was watching a lot of uh, people on the in the Antifa Antifa world talking about uh, people be getting rounded up already. So uh, it's already as as they're rounding up people on the right that associated with the capital event, uh, even you know one degree off the capital event or one you know one layer off, uh, people who supported it, uh, they're doing the same thing on the left of, with with Antifa. Uh, they won't touch BLM, but they'll, they'll they'll go after them. And if you go out and riot in this environment, man, <laughs> you're basically putting a target on your head. This is a this is not this is not easy stuff. What does Patriot Act 2.0 look like in your mind? 
Well, you know, all the limitations right now on, on NSA and others, are, you know, they have a lot of limitations on what they can gather about U.S. persons. And um, those will be lifted for designated individuals and their networks, association networks. That, you know, anyone's associated with people who have a history of saying X, Y, Z or posting Confederate flags and things like that, they are going to be in the uh, threat list in these big blacklists that uh, that drive these things and anyone who are uh, associated with them and they'll be monitored and they will be targeted and uh, they will be baited as we often saw with the you know way we went after Islamic terrorism that, you know some mentally challenged guy will be talking you know shit online and then some FBI agent will then bait him with with hey do you want to you know do this I have some uh, weapons I, I can sell you, or I can have some bomb materials I can sell you. And the guy goes, oh yeah, sure. Had, whereas it, that guy on his own had no capacity to do any of this stuff. Uh, no capacity to you know, generate the materials or, or, or put them together in any useful fashion or execute an attack. So um, yeah, all these folks are going to be targeted like that. Wow. That's pretty dystopian. Uh, what, <laughs> one of the things you talked about uh, in uh, recently was you talked about open source secret police system. What do you mean by that? Oh, yeah, that's what I was talking about uh, in terms of getting pictures. They took that 42 gigabytes from Parler and they sifted through it. Um, about 11 hours of really good video that came out of that. And then they went and pulled 6,000 unique or what they 6,000 images of faces. And they narrowed that down uh, to people that they uh, uh, are trying to narrow it down by taking out the police images. Um, and then it's interesting the the group that's doing this is just posting the images. So there's kind of a, like a, putting a firewall between doing that act and then what comes after. And so law enforcement will upload those and do their ID work uh, and lots of different layers of law, and more law enforcement because everybody is going to be militarized. You know, the, the militarization of the police we saw after 9-11 is going to be nothing compared to what's coming, um, you know, in terms of militarization down to the, you know, the beat cop level. Uh, and then you have the uh, uh, open source version, and those people will run facial recognition, and they'll do a lot of hand searching, and they'll find these people. And you can see there's a steady stream of this where Antifa has got people that they've identified from it. They know where they work. They post their names and, and where they work and their home address and they everyone goes after them and then they start calling the work nonstop to get the person fired they contact all the people in their contact list on facebook um, and say that they're fascists they say that they're they're nazis they say that they're you know, uh, white supremacists and you should just disconnect from them um, and um, that's the open source version my worry is that it even goes even farther by then putting it into the blockchain and then it becomes forever what do you think about, um, you know, historically, if you look at, you know, what happened after uh, the Russian Revolution, you know, early Soviet days where they had these large purges or, you know, you look in, uh, you know, at the Cultural Revolution with Mao, there were these purges, these physical purges that occurred. Right. And one of the things I've been thinking a lot based upon the stuff that you've written is that maybe most of the purges actually occur in the virtual world. The vast majority of it is occurring in the virtual world, but of course it's going to intersect into physical reality right. in a big way at some point. What do you think about that? And where does that intersection, when does it, when does it become much more about, you know, the real world? And I know it affects people's jobs and they're getting people fired and things like that, but you know, right. I don't see purges where they're sending police to your door and taking you, you know, disappearing you in the middle of the night. I mean, is that something? Well, what are your thoughts? Oh, we're going to see that with the counterterrorism, counterinsurgency effort. That goes right into the real world from the get-go. Um, mm -hmm. And then the attempts on the open source side to you know, contact your employer and contact your friends and family, your wife, uh, your kids. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, what the big corporations are doing, the big network corporations, is much more scalable. Uh, and they can see down to the conversational level and then target you. So right now they're just waiting you, you, you know, they're developing a trustworthy metric and the, and a, you know, extremist metric, and that's being attached to your identity. Um, what they're doing on the, on, on the network side is much more scary long-term um, and much more permanent is that you know, we're finding that we're 
modern life is connected to this network world increasingly. Um, we do everything through these networks. And then, um, you know, everything from dating uh, apps to uh, job search to if you're running a small business, you have to get flow through these networks. You have to advertise through them. You have to, if you want to publish, and, and you have to go through them. Um, you want to communicate, you have to go through them. And people, you know, if you can't communicate, then you can't really do much. And your personhood is tied up in this digital network. And um, what we're finding is when they target you, they don't just kick you off maybe one big social network. It has a disconnection cascade that flows down through all the networks. So the guy, uh, CEO running Parler, when they threw off, when Amazon Web Services disconnected Parler, uh, it caused a cascade of disconnections. And he was saying, uh, you know, my email provider disconnected me. My text provider disconnected me. Um, my lawyer left me. I mean, it was like one thing after another. It's a, it basically unpersons you. So it turns, it creates this, uh, we're having a, that social credit score that we were talking about in China is already being implemented. And um, you can be unpersoned from the modern digital world, which then, your you know, financial future is curtailed, your ability to connect with other people, uh, ability, you know, if you're unmarried to get married, it goes way down and your selection pool gets shrunk since everybody, all the young people are all meeting online. Um, and that uh, you're an open air prison, open air digital prison, you're locked out. And we, we see, I don't think people fully appreciate how much of a parallel power structure this corporate network is. I mean, we have all these controls. We have a constitution. We have a bill of rights. Everything that is, con, you know, constrains the power of government, um, because we know that excesses of, you know, the government excesses can do horrible things. Uh, but we have nothing for this network. It's running open loop. There's no natural limiting factors. Um, and how that rolls out is something I've been thinking a lot about. It's just like it, that's that's a bad news for not just now, but in the future. I, I do know that, like, you know, you think of these examples with the social media and it's just about mostly about communication and commerce. But then when you, you know, we, I know people that have been banned from Airbnb, for instance, or been right. banned from Uber or, or, you know, maybe even Uber Eats. So like you can't you can't leave your house now because we're on lockdown, but then you can't order food. Right. Um, you know, it really gets it can go to places that I think are I didn't appreciate at first. I'm like, you get out, kicked off Twitter. Uh, what's is that the end of the world? Probably not. But, right, but the, but it gets down to these really basic necessities as everything is funneled through a few key companies, especially. And they well, they have this parallel network, you know, back kind of a uh, uh, this collusion of sorts where they share the blacklists increasingly. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're knocked off one network, your name goes to the other networks. You know, as somebody not to be on, you know, trusted, not to be worthy of of, of offering services to. Um, and that's a completely unregulated thing. I mean, they've been using a lot of uh, very partisan organizations to kind of identify which groups are, are, are dangerous, you know, and then all the libertarian groups now are considered extremist organizations in the States. Uh, I even had a uh, Brennan on yesterday saying, you know, yeah, uh, we should treat libertarians as terrorists. I mean, it's like, along with everybody else, they are, they're enemies of the state. Um, yeah, it's getting crazy. I, I I call this future and oh, go ahead, Doug. You have some. No, I, I, I was uh, agreeing with you, but I was going to I was going to add um, one thing. I I'm of the opinion that the Bill of Rights, which is the only important part of the U.S. Constitution, really, is basically a dead letter at this point. And the fact that uh, you know, there's two things that, well, two important things that people like are money and power, and especially since the government itself is bankrupt at this point. Uh, but you've got these multi-billionaires, but now that they've got money, they want power. And of course, it's a, a Mussolini type thing, a melding of the state and uh, the big money, the corporations. That's what's happening before our Is this going to result in a civil war? Uh, I mean, it's an online civil war. It's kind of a, a virtual civil war right now. I, I, you know, McLuhan in 68 called it a, a global uh, guerrilla information war. You know, it's like World War Three will be that. We're constantly battling it out online, trying to see who would be dominant. Um, 
though I think it's pretty lopsided and one-sided at this point between the establishment and his counterterrorism, counterinsurgency stuff. I mean, you know, as this hollow state is the only good at one thing is, you know, hammering down nails and um, projecting this image of hypernormality. And then you have the corporations getting censorship and, and disconnection down to the individual level. They can watch every conversation that's occurring online. They can censor you at that level. Plus all the AIs that are being built on that to nudge everybody and watch everything in real time. Uh, it's so a pretty it, one-sided battle at this point. Uh, it is. And so it's actually becoming quite dangerous to become one of these 75 million or so perceived deplorables. I mean, it could get nasty for them. Right. That's, uh, if you're an anti-vaxxer, uh, it's dangerous for you. If you're, uh, you know, somebody who's like a, Anti-world, anti-round worlders, you know, flat earthers, or some, it's dangerous for you because you could be, la you know, targeted and disconnected for even something as innocuous as that. Um, I call this future that it, I wrote a report a couple of years ago. That my worry is that the consensus function, if it gets the stronger side in this battle between consensus and dissent, is that consensus in a network world can become total. It can become locked in through AIs and locked in through this corporate uh, control of our conversations and our, our, our uh, dialogues. And um, we're headed towards that. Uh, and uh, this is a, a long night is a civilization killer. I mean, it, it creates a, a very narrow orthodoxy of what's allowed and what, what can be talked about and uh, how the world should be seen and what is a fact and what is not a fact it has to comply. And anything else is screened out. It's totally wiped out. And if you push it, you're disconnected. And uh, that that kind of future is, is is in our foreground right now. We're barreling towards it. Um, if you get violent on the far side of that, you know, trying to you'll get hit by the counterterrorism, counterinsurgency group. Uh, if you hit, try to even talk about it, you get hit by the corporate disconnection, unpersoning. Um, it's a it's a very dangerous future, and I don't see many people saying anything about it they're you know for the most part they're kind of cheering on the uh, the idea that they'll go after the people that were at the capitol event it's a scary scary world so what uh, so here's what something interesting is that uh well i mean no, uh, a lot of people will say oh you know you, you got you got bitcoin you got alternative texts and i'm you know as much as i love those extra those alternative texts and i was like in the Global Gorillas kind of framework. You know, alternative texts are are great. Um, you know, for hot insurgencies. You know, uh, for small group communication and the like. Uh, but they're not viable alternatives for you know, you know, political uh, resistance to this I mean, because it's too easy to, to, to disconnect. Uh, you have uh, uh, Janet Yellen just talking about Bitcoin being a mostly used for uh, terrorist financing and, and the like, uh, and that she's going to come after it as Treasury Secretary. And that, uh, you know, what we saw with the big platforms is that they can line up every single big platform at once to disconnect something. And if they do that at the protocol level or they do it at the hosting level for Bitcoin, it's gone. It just, it, it becomes just something you, Iran is using. And it's not really that much useful that if you can't connect to it or c conduct a transaction. And even they are starting to crack down on the on the electricity use there because of blackouts. So, uh, I alternative tech is great for small stuff. Uh, it's not like a, I think we have to figure out a way to fight for control of the platform. And and the only way I can see right now to do that uh, is to have a digital bill of rights. And if anything that Republicans become or anything that, that the, the right becomes, it pushes one thing is this digital bill of rights that's forced on the corporations um, that you know, forces them to define you know, the limits of free speech, which are, you know, should be you know, only if you're threatening somebody directly with physical violence, you, know, you, you can be uh, disconnected. And that disconnection, if you're a known person with an identity, it's, it's not permanent has a short period of time to like put in digital jail for a short period of time. The details of which, uh, you know, how this would work is, you know, you have to be hashed out, but we need a digital bill of rights to constrain the companies and keep this platform open. So it doesn't just, the gates don't close immediately and um, uh, 
there's no alternative but the long night because um, alternative tech is great but it's not gonna not gonna save us from this thing boy are they down the tracks and um when, well here's something interesting is that um one of the things i saw with the corporations that they're looking for legitimacy uh they're looking for some kind of street level legitimacy uh they got some of that by going after and disconnecting Trump after the Capitol event. And, you know, they've cut a kind of a bargain with the, with the politicians in, uh, in Washington uh, by saying, OK, we'll, we'll protect you. We'll protect you from the, all the, the Trump movement and the right uh, if you leave us alone. And, and they're willing to do that. Uh, anyone who tries to, you know, in the political world, tries to attack them directly will end up like Elizabeth Warren uh, when she attacked him. She just got tanked and all it takes is a couple al algorithmic tweaks to the, to the communication structure and that politician dies. There's no way you could be elected if they're against you, um, unless you're overwhelmingly the favorite. Uh, so uh, they are also looking at trying to uh, cut a deal with uh, the tribal left, mostly the anti-racist, anti-colonialists. Uh, they have, a lot of their employees are already in the tribal left, and um, it creates a, something I, it, it, you know, with the hollowing out the nation state, the whole idea of you know return of socialism is is probably where they you know raise taxes to grow the bureaucracy to do things is uh, pretty remote. It's very unlikely to happen, and that you know even Europe is trying to find ways to get out of it, but it's proving unable to do it. What we'll see though is something a variant on that is I, I call it personal socialism. Um, you know, it's kind of a coerced altruism, but focused on the individual and that the corporations allying with the tribal left will force individuals to give up extra, right? for, change their behavior or face censure. So if you have an environmental goal, if you have a, uh, you know, a diversity goal in your corporation and uh, it, you have a choice to make on hiring and, and, and opportunity, who, who do you give the opportunity to? Uh, that will be pushed. It's a costless thing for these companies and these oligarchs. They don't, it won't cost them anything. It's not like taxes being raised to, to fund uh, socialist programs or, you know, uh, you know, big national programs at the net, you know, in the, using a government. Uh, they can implement this stuff, gain street level legitimacy with, with millions. Um, and it costs them nothing to implement. Uh, and it becomes part of this framework, this long night. It's just part of this narrow view of looking at the world. If your behavior should be this, because that's the way uh, you should be contributing to the system. And everyone becomes more, you know, more similar over time. Uh, so just tossing that out there, it's a big idea, but uh, all the costs are borne by the individual. It's not borne by the population as a whole through taxes. No, I mean, I, this is, here's a classic thing to kind of get your head around. It. It's like, you know, when your kids say, oh, you shouldn't have that second home because it's an example of white privilege, right? They won't visit it. They won't, because that is something that's not allowed. That's looked down upon and that gets oh. folded into the, into, into what's <laughs> being nudged and what's being pushed by social networks. That's the kind of thing. Uh, that extra car, uh, you know, who you hired, all these people are qualified candidates. These people are amazing, but look, there's one person in, in, in this, in this, uh, uh, historically disadvantaged category that just got over the bar, pick that person. And if you don't, you're banned. Well, you know, that goes in line with John. We, we talked to Doug and I talked a, a couple months ago about NASDAQ came out with new reporting obligations for all publicly traded companies on that exchange where they had to, you know, report the, the amount of the number of, of diverse members of their boards, for instance. Right. And that kind of that creates that context for that. Right. Oh, no. Yeah. The corporations are looking for that legitimacy and they're going to get that through appeal to the tribal left. And um, yeah, that's that's, you know, look at you. They'll say, look at all the things that we're doing for you. We're implementing this. We're going after the, the, the people that you've described as, as the enemies of, of the future <laughs> and uh, making their lives miserable. Uh, that's why we're here. 
That's what you know. Well, <laughs> support us. If somebody's coming after us, support us. No, I agree, John. I, uh, but it sounds to me like uh, those of us who are uh, oriented towards libertarianism, free minds, free markets, personal freedom, that type of thing, we're on the wrong side of history. I mean, if you take the uh, Myers-Briggs test, you find that libertarians are almost all INTJs, and they're only about 2.5% of the population. So, you know, the people that are ideologically pro-freedom are like a rounding error. And it sounds to me, well, just based on what Brennan said the other day, that we're on the wrong side of history and bad things are going to happen to us and we could get washed away. So what do you suggest we do on a practical level? Right. Is there anything that you can think of? Um, keep your head down. Be careful <laughs> about what you say and post. I mean, I've been talking about sensitive subjects forever. I mean, since my global guerrilla days when talking about terrorism and, and uh, I've kind of learned how to live in this environment, you know, where if you said the wrong thing, you'd be put on the wrong list. Um, but everybody's in that boat now. So uh, you have to be very, very careful. And, you know, you understand that it's not a symmetrical system. You know, other people couldn't get away with saying stuff that you can't say. Uh, you can't post what or say or do anything that you think is right if it will cause alarm bells to go off. Um, I, it's hard to actually say if there's any country that will, if you know, diversifying globally, obviously that's always an option. But I mean, Facebook has three and a half billion members um, and it's growing at 200,000 new members a day. So uh, this system, this, the, the AIs that are going to be built. These, you know, everyone thinks of AIs as this kind of human like thing that talks to you. And you no, know, the AIs that are actually being built, the monster ones that they have all the data from all these social networks, uh, they live in between our connections, you know, our social connections. Uh, they're not human. Like they are mitigating our conversations. They're directing us. They're figuring out things about us. Um, those are the AIs that we're interacting with every day. Those are going to be the most valuable things on the planet. Kind of a, think of it as a social artifact. In fact, all of this fight right now that we're having between dissent and consensus is over who gets to set the rules of those social artifacts because they're going to exist. They're going to you know, moderate and mitigate and, 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 and you know, largely control the conversations of, of everybody outside of China. Um, and China's building their own. Is that do you want a system that is very controlling and locks us down or do you want something that uh, you know, has a dynamism to it? And that was the digital bill of rights would be one. And then I like the idea of digital ownership where you own all data collected on uh, about you. And if we start on that basis, even if we lock it into a blockchain that, you know, is shared visa style with all the big oligarchs and their companies, and you can then pool your data with other people uh, and sell it to companies and set limits on, you know, uh, how they're using it, uh, that changes the whole dynamic. That creates a, a vast amount of wealth for tons of people and a dynamism in the society that uh, with protections built in that uh, can bring us forward, can zoom us. Because so much of what we're living in or, you know, in the future is going to be online um, or in this virtual realm. Uh, you know, I would love to see a dynamic system like that. Uh, there is a kind of a, a group of people that are growing parallel to what, uh, you know, what we see in, on the social networks that may be useful is, uh, you know, people who are like in uh, playing Minecraft, for instance, kids. There are tens of millions of kids that are, they love that, that creative atmosphere and the collaborative atmosphere of building things in Minecraft. They build cities, they build, uh, they create narratives, they, and they're doing it constantly. They're addicted to it because of the control it provides them um, over, you know, over the world and, and the collaborative uh, enjoyment of building something together. And those kids that were kind of grew up thinking that way may be enlisted in this. Um, they seem, they, I think they will get it. This idea of digital you know, ownership, you own the data, you own your data, and that uh, you, sh you have rights online. You have protections that protect you from being unpersoned uh, based on the, the whims of, a, of an oligarch. So, um, 
yeah, those are yeah, those are the two. I, I had another one that I was thinking that there has to be more open access because the big guys are Amazon and Apple and um, Google are putting about a thirty percent tax on all small business. I mean, if you want to list an app on on you know, Google or Android's a, a marketplace, you pay thirty percent not only of the sale of the thing but every single transaction thereafter. And if you wanted to go to iPhone, you pay exactly the same, thirty percent on everything. And so they're taxing all these small businesses and, and depressing uh, their their initial growth. Uh, and that Amazon's doing something similar in terms of distribution. So uh, they force you into their distribution system, and then they put restrictions on you such that they're making money every single way because they're a monopoly, monopoly provider in this regard. There really isn't that much of an alternative. Um, and these guys are getting bigger, faster, becoming more dominant. Um, 99% of all the apps that people download are from those two big guys, Apple and Google. So uh, there's not choice. So if we can make it possible that these companies can't disconnect these small businesses and individuals willy-nilly from those systems and um, make it more transparent in terms of fairness of entry for for the small small companies, we might see a lot more dynamism at the small company level because that's disappearing in the states with COVID. Those are the guys that are getting crushed. 80% of employment with small business in the states and those small businesses are getting destroyed by COVID um, and the you know, expansion of the big guys. It seems to me that this trend is in motion and gaining momentum. So things are going to get a lot worse before they eventually get better, perhaps for the reason that you pointed out about the kids with Minecraft and such. Is that, would you agree with that? Yep. Much worse before it could possibly get better? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and all the big companies are going to be doing really, really well in the future. They're protected now. They got all, you know, all that COVID relief, half of that goes to those guys. Uh, that's why the market keeps on going up, even though the, the, the economy is getting walloped is because those listed companies are the ones getting the, the aid. Uh, so if, if, if you want to invest in the future, those, those guys are, are, are sure thing at this point. They're, they're all considered too big to fail and they're going to get whatever they need, whatever they want, and they can do in a, whatever they want. But yeah, you're right. The only, there is a, isn't any uh, exit I see in the, in the near term or even the medium term um, from this kind of disastrous scenario. Um, all you can do is kind of wait it out write it out, hopefully people, enough people become disaffected with it that uh, it could be reversed and, and hopefully through something like restorative, like a, like a digital bill of rights and digital ownership. Um, because right now, you know, I, I see a digital ownership, owning the data that you have is as a big a transformation in society as private property ownership. And the idea that only feudal lords with title can own property and, you know, was present forever. And then all of a sudden that changed that, you know, allowing private individuals without title to own the property um, was, was a big innovation. And this is the same thing is that the data you have right now is, is being stripped mined by the, the, by, by the big companies and building the most valuable thing in the world, these big social AIs, marketing AIs. Uh, and uh, they're doing it, for free and they have no real restrictions on how they do it. And that the only alternative we have is through some kind of privacy rules. It's kind of like a, you know, a revision on the feudal contract. Okay. That the Lord can only beat you three times a month kind of thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you only in, only in the worst year when the water is, you know, the rainfall is very, very low. Do you get a reduction in the, in the amount you have to tithe to them? Uh, it's, it's privacy doesn't do it. It's, it's just a, and, no one can agree on what privacy is. What you need is ownership. And um, I haven't seen anyone talk about that. Hmm. Absolutely zero. All right. That's You're a, making some fantastic points. You really are. All right, John, always, always full of great ideas and new ways of thinking. I have, I have two kind of controversial things I just wanted to ask you about before we sure. wrap up, if you don't mind. Uh, one is that you posted something about, we talked about uh, mRNA vaccines, that they were um, part of a, uh, DARPA invested effort in order to try and build a 
uh, biological platform. Can you explain more of that, what your, what your thinking and understanding is around that? Yeah, DARPA announced in 2017 that they're working on a, a rapid pandemic uh, vaccine program. And their main investment was mRNA vaccines, uh, basically because they, you know, they're very fast to develop. I mean, you basically, you could do the design for uh, what you want in, in just a couple of days on a computer. And uh, it doesn't require growing, growing anything in the lab, but what you do is it's all a manufacturing process and you can get vaccines out in 90 days. Um, and these vaccines you know, came out of that DARPA stuff and, and, and they, the problem was is that they uh, are very volatile, which is good. You want these things to be volatile. You want these things to decay very rapidly in vivo in, inside your body. Um, so they have to be kept at a very, very low temperature, 50 degrees below zero, 50, 70 degrees below zero. Um, and that volatility, though, also means that there's a huge infrastructure burden to build out the capability of, of distributing these and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, giving them to people. So um, that burden had kept the mRNA industry small and basically confined to the lab. Well, COVID changed that. So now we have this capacity. Everyone's learning how to distribute and uh, give these vaccines and mRNA vaccines, both of which came out of the, uh, the U.S. Uh, well, man, you know, uh, manufactured by U.S. multinationals um, are now you know, part of the it's, it's, a, it's a transformation in medicine um, because these mRNA vaccines are basically just telling the cell what to do for a very short period of time to produce a protein, a very specific protein. And that could be done for a variety of different diseases. You can do that for, uh, you know, diabetes. They're doing it for AIDS. An AIDS vaccine is being worked on. They're doing a, uh, oh, you could do it for obesity. You could, there's all these different ways of using this technology to basically vaccinate for almost anything. Um, so if you're, though, if you're allergic to vaccines, <laughs> or you have a you know uh, a autoimmune kind of tendency uh might doubt to be that good of a future uh, but they also say they're having vaccines for uh, allergies so if you have a peanut allergy or if you have a very specific sensitivity they're, they're developing vaccines for that uh, using this tech so it was just watching this roll out it's like wow it got built overnight because of covid and it's going to transform medicine going forward um so, uh, you know, it seems a little open loop, though, because, it, you know, once you start to do that kind of, you know, base level, whole population, uh, genetic changing and genetic manipulation, it's, um, a lot of things can go bad. Uh, and they go bad big because everybody's getting it. Hmm. Well, and yeah, and, and Amazon came out yesterday announcing they'd be happy to help with uh, distribution because they've got the best distribution system in the world right and they right can volunteer to do that yeah they'll probably they'll probably eat it all up right now is mostly you know cobbled together different sources including the military doing a lot of the distribution end and then amazon will probably swallow that whole industry so they'll be the vaccine distributor again you know big corporations eating everything i mean amazon's growth has been phenomenal it's... one other somewhat uh, controversial topic i just want to get your thoughts on is you know, there's been a lot of, um, there's a lot of, in these social networks, there's a lot of information. And then there is, I think, naturally a lot of disinformation. Right. And, you know, you posted something not long ago that said basically every political post is a psyop. Right. And, you know, I just, I mean, I wonder how much of this is, is a, you know, state actor level uh, trying to, you know, shape the hearts and minds of people or, you know, and how much of it is just, you know, trolls and bad, you know, just people who just want to throw, throw uh, sand in the gears of the system, but especially in light of the fact that there were some headlines a few months ago about, about, uh, you know, Stanley McChrystal and his, again, DARPA funded AI driven, um, you know, uh, information warfare software that they were using. And I don't, I don't mean, is that real? Is that, is that part of this mix? Well, when I said PSYOP, uh, it, it's a guerrilla information war where, where, where everybody, everybody's a participant. Okay, so everybody's, whether you want to be or not, you're a participant. If you decide to stay offline, you're still a participant, but you're not contributing. <laughs> you're not not a player. Um, and 
that turns every political post into a PSYOP. Everyone is, you know, who's posting something about politics, something about society is trying to influence the audience, uh, trying to sway them towards their view, uh, trying to, you know, inflame them, trying to anger them, trying to uh, influence their, their way of thinking using, using that post, using that uh, um, picture or, 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 or uh, phrase. So, um, yeah, there's, no, this is more participatory. I don't see the government as a big player. I, I just really haven't seen much that's really compelling on the government side. Uh, this moves too fast. Uh, it was like when they were talking about Russia's involvement in the Trump's campaign. I go, man, there was like three to 400,000 people in the Donald group on Reddit. And they were like pumping out memes and things that Trump was using daily and spreading stuff uh, all over Facebook and everything else. Uh, and they were talking about, you know, Internet Research Agency over in Russia doing anything. Their stuff was like ham-fisted. It was terrible. I mean, it was always off off topic. And it was like, you could tell it was was terrible. Of uh, The moment you read it, it was Russian, right? And that uh, this, the really good stuff was being built by the, these this big open source insurgency where everyone was just contributing and throwing stuff in. Um, it was, you know, people going, well, they this the Russian stuff maybe got a million views on, on YouTube. I go... They're doing billions of views a day on YouTube. Mm. What four and a half, five billion views a day on YouTube? That's not even that's not even a, a rounding error. That's like a million views over the course of a whole mm. campaign. Was, oh well. Anyway, uh, the Russian the government stuff is lost in the mix. It, you know they can add they can add um, to the kind of disorientation by hacking, releasing information. Um, that's probably the only thing that they really can do, but all the hard work of actually making use of it is, is done by the open source, you know, guerrilla information war participants. So they just toss that data over the, over the, over the wall and then people just rip it apart and they do all sorts of stuff with it. Um, they won't be able to control how it's released or have, you know, any, any good things to do with it. Well, yeah. you mentioned hacking. So I, I think I have to ask you one, one last question about, the, the major hacking that was reported, you know, just before, uh, or I guess it was just after the election that was reported, you know, that it was and, and everything. I mean, uh, how real is that? Uh, how much of a threat is that sort of thing? No, no. They, yeah. Um, I thought the OPM hack from your, you know, four or five years ago where the Chinese grabbed all the information, all the records, personnel records of everybody in the military and the government, including, uh, uh people with, with, TS clearances and above was more of a disaster than than this uh, because that allows them to target people with a great deal of accuracy with lots of information on, on uh, how to do it. Um, yeah, we're in a constant, at least at the governmental level, information war. Uh, they're crawling over our systems constantly. And the solution is the obvious solution is to um, put all of those government agencies inside the NSA cloud, because that NSA cloud is built by hand, right? It's built by the agency. Um, and they're not allowed to do that because all of these companies want these big contracts delivering services. They want the cloud contracts. They want the uh, security software contracts. They want the hosting, con you know, on and on and on and on. All these different, uh, there's so many billions to be made. They're preventing this transfer. Um, and uh, as a result, there's a huge amount of, of vulnerability inside the NSA cloud. Those AIs are crazy. I mean, you don't want to go up against those AIs. So NSA is, uh, AIs will, will chew you up. Wow. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, solutions are simple, but because of the corruption in the system, they won't do it. You know, if you have critical systems, put them inside their cloud. In fact, I think that maybe is the only real function of government right now is, that, is you take is to protect the systems that need protecting and, and take the ones that are critical infrastructure and things that could be hacked and destroyed and cause all sorts of havoc and put them inside a secure environment and protect them. Um, hmm. So there isn't like any kind of huge leverage point that somebody could push on and then cause it, everything to collapse. And right now it's not, it's just open, it's out there protected by the corporate environment where 
millions of people are making you know lots of money delivering those services, but uh, not delivering on the uh, the security that should be you know, provided. Got it. Yep, that's good. So, Doug, any any last questions you might have for John before we let him go? No, I I, I thought this was fantastic, John. You brought up at least a dozen really, really interesting uh, points that just aren't discussed. So i uh, love to have you back. And, uh, and how can people access your newsletter? Um, because it's, you only publish yeah, it Yeah, I regularly. have the Global Guerrillas Report. Yeah. Monthly. Yeah, okay. I have it. It's a, it's a monthly, monthly report. And I have, uh, it's on uh, patreon.com slash John Robb. And uh, it's like five bucks or 10 bucks if you want access to the Discord. Uh, you know, the Discord is really pretty good too. There's a lot of high quality minds talking about all sorts of different topics. And most of the people get, have already read all the reports and they get it and they could have a high level of discussion. It's civil, which is awesome. You know, you've not many places online you can actually discuss stuff. It's not to, everyone's at each other's throats over these topics. Um, and, you know, I, it's about three years in the archive and, and, you know, even now I, I forget what I wrote and I go back in the archive and I read a report like, uh, you know, two years ago, how government is outsourcing stability operations to corporations and, and how that works. And I was like, wow, I wrote that. That was pretty cool. Or that, uh, you know, as soon as the, the Trump insurgency forks and causes a violent event, there will be this counter, you know, counterterrorism. Uh, effort launched and things like that, um, or even the development of the uh, kind of open source shaming system that we're seeing where people are grabbing pictures and how that's going to evolve. So, yeah, it's a lot of cool stuff in the in the reports, and they're only like five, six pages, and they're in the kind of Forrester style where they they have the uh, paragraph bullet, 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 so it's scannable. And each, uh, each report, I think I'm trying to fit a book into a framework, <laughs> you know, to get everything down to a really simple framework that you can use to help make sense of what's going on in this rapidly changing environment. And um, yeah, if it works, it works, but it doesn't have to be hundred percent correct to be useful. Yeah. Everybody should subscribe to this. Everybody should subscribe to it. If you're interested in understanding what's happening in the world today, uh, I strongly encourage it. Um, I am a subscriber, you know, have been a long time reader of John's work and uh, I will link to it in the description of this and I encourage you to go sign up. So with that, John, thank you very much. I really appreciate thanks, you coming man. on today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And, and thanks, Doug. You're gone, but uh, it was a pleasure. And, and I'll come on anytime if you want to talk in the future. And I will do less talking and more discussing since we just was, yeah. was kind of a level, level set for the for the uh, where we're at. We want to. We really want to hear you talk. To be honest, <laughs> uh, we appreciate it. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, thanks. John. All right. Appreciate it. Yep. My pleasure.